Now let's talk about intellectual property rights rules in the IETF. First of all, who do they apply to? They apply to all participants in the IETF. Remember that the IETF doesn't have members, so there's no member agreement that you're signing. It's participants. All participants in the IETF are subject to the IETF's IPR rules, intellectual property rights rules. If you want to register for a mailing list or register for a face-to-face -face session, then, you are, then you're exposed to what is called the note well note. An example of that's on the left. That lists you the conditions under which uh, you have to disclose I IPR, and it also points out that there's two RFCs that you have to adhere to and agree to follow as part of your participation. We don't require you to sign anything, but the fact that you published an RFC, or published an internet draft, or attended a meeting meant that you were exposed to this and, and uh, essentially agreed to these conditions. So the statement uh, is if you this statement the note well note or a variant of it is published as post, posted as the first thing in most IETF face-to-face -face sessions it's supposed to be published posted as the first thing and most of the time that happens occasionally the working group chairs screw up but most of the time anybody who goes to an IETF meeting will be shown this note well note a dozen times or many more times during the course of a week if they go to more than, more than one session because each session will have this uh, document posted. There are basically two types of IPR, uh, copyright and patent. The copyright is the who has rights to the text in the document itself. Patent rights is who has rights to the technology that is discussed in the patent. It's a different concept. The picture on the left is the statute uh, of, of Anne, which is the original copyright document. It's the original place that copyright is talked about. Uh, the U.S. Constitution talks about uh, copyrights and also patents. And the quota of the U.S. Constitution is to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing the, for limited times to the authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. This is of the power, Congress has the power to do this under the Constitution. The limited time period is a matter of interpretation under copyright. The current in the U.S., the copyright is uh, 90 years plus the lifetime of the author. Uh, that's most people wouldn't call that limited, but the Congress has called it limited, and that's way it sticks. The, the Supreme Court has upheld that definition of limited, though that when they did, they said that there's probably a limit to limited, but they haven't defined what that limit is. All right, well, let's first talk about copyright. This is a, the ITF's copyright rules on the left. That's part of the, tr the trust legal provisions. In the, for the ITF, if you write an internet draft, you have to give the IETF the perpetual right, non-exclusive right, to publish it. Otherwise, what's the point? Uh, the, you give us the right to publish any internet draft that you submit, anything you say on a mailing list, anything that you say in a uh, meeting will be published. The meeting minutes will be published. The meetings are streamed and audio, audio recorded, so that's published in that way. So you need to give the IETF non-exclusive publication rights. And usually you give, also give the IETF the rights to make derivative works, works that are variants of the, what you have produced. So if you produce an internet draft and you submit it to the IETF uh, and you don't, you, you decide that that's all you're going to do, you're not going to work on it, you're just going to submit it, somebody else in the IETF can take that internet draft and revise it and push it all the way through to become an RFC and a standard. You have given the IETF the right to do that. Now there's a right, there's a requirement in the IETF standards process that says that if somebody does take your internet draft and modifies it, they have to acknowledge that the internet draft came from you. So the original authors and anybody who makes significant contributions to a document must be acknowledged in the document. So you don't, you don't lose the, the PR of actually having written it, even if you hand it over to somebody else and the, somebody else's name appears first on the, uh, the author list. Normally, you produce this derivative rights uh, requirement that the, the, you're required to hand over the ability to make derivative wire, works. 
But occasionally, you can decide that what you're producing, for example, is a standard from another technical body or a corporate document. In those cases, you don't have to give a derivative work right. You can never, that can never be a standard because we have to have, the ITF has to have the ability to fix bugs in standards. And if you, you retain the derivative works right, then we wouldn't be able to do that. So you can't have a standards document that has blocked derivative works. But you can if you want it just for your other purposes, for example, corporate documentation. Other than that, other than this uh, non-exclusive publication right and the right to make derivative works, you retain all rights to your document. If you want to take this pinochle playing protocol internet draft that you created and turn it into the great American or great Australian novel, go to it. That's right. It's up your alley. You can do it. You could submit it to other, art, other standards bodies. You can do anything you want with it, except take away from us, the IETF, the right to publish the document. Now let's talk about patents. And all standards bodies have significant problems with patents. The biggest problem with patents is when they are not disclosed. And somebody, a standards organization, builds and defines this technical specification. Vendors go out and manufacture that and start selling it gets out in the field, and a few layers later, a patent holder starts suing everybody for patent infringement. It's a very ugly situation. Those are called submarine patents. We really don't like those, and nobody particularly likes them. It's a surprise to the vendors. They thought they were implementing a standard, and certainly, suddenly it turns out that they have to pay some lawyers a lot of money. So I don't like to do that. So the way the IETF deals with this is that we require disclosure. All participants in the IETF are required to disclose intellectual property rights under specific circumstances when those IPRs might relate to technology being discussed in an IETF working group. IETF working groups take any disclosed IPR into account when deciding which technology to use in their specifications. The IETF does not, like some standards bodies, require that specifications not have any disclosed IPR. W3C, for example, says they cannot standardize anything where somebody has claimed intellectual property rights on a particular technology. We decided in the IETF to not go down that route. We had a very long and heated discussion decided not to go down that route. We don't want to make the, let the working group make up its own mind about whether the, what technology to, to adopt. Some cases, every technology that's possible to be used has, in, in, has IPR disclosures on it. Somebody claims patent rights on it. Robust header compression in cell phones, for example, is that way. When the IETF adopted a, a, a robust header compression RFC specification, it was one that had, a, had patent, people claiming patents on it. But that's just the way it was. The technology is being used by cell phone manufacturers, and cell phone manufacturers know how to deal with IPR claims. But we also don't require that the, uh, the working group adopt something simply because there's been a disclosure. That's uh, the reverse of this. So the working group basically is, gives allowed to make up their own mind about what technology to adopt, whether it's IPR constraints or not. And note that you won't get IPR disclosures from people who are not part of the IETF in general. There are certainly some folks who tell the IETF that you're infringing on our technology just to be nice, but there is not requ no requirement to do that if you're not participating in the IETF. And so just because the W3C says, well, we won't adopt anything where people have told us that there's, there's patents, doesn't mean there's not patents, and doesn't mean that somebody won't start suing over patent infringement later on, because they just because they haven't told the W3C about it. So we decided that actually that wasn't that profitable a way to go in the ITF. The ITF does not require that IPR disclosures include any licensing information. We ask for it, but it doesn't require it. The two types of standard, two types of Standard licensing, which most often seen in the disclosure which are made, is RAND, which is reasonable and non-discriminatory, and FRAND, which is fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. They're pretty much interchangeable. This is where a vendor says, well, I will ch license this under fair terms. Fair terms could be free. Uh, 
oh, I'm just signing a license. Sometimes it's just free, period. Uh, most common type of license that's uh, disclosed in the ITF is one where it says, you can use it for free as long as you don't sue me over patent infringement. If you sue me over some patent infringement on your side, you no longer have a license to use my technology in your product. So if, if the company is if the company is disincented to suing another company over uh, IPR because they would be blocked from using the IPR themselves or using the other vendor's IPR itself. We do not require, the ITF does not require that if somebody says, oh yeah, we're going to license it under fair and non-discriminatory, that because of that, that the working group must adopt the technology. This is the case in some standards bodies. If a vendor says fair and non-discriminatory, then that's a requirement. The working group must, must adopt that technology. We don't do that. When do you, must you disclose? The ITF says you must disclose. Well, when? Under what conditions you must you disclose? The first condition is you must disclose when the IPR, the, the patent or patent application, is reasonably and personally known to you as an individual participant. Reasonably and personally means that you know about it or that because of your job position, you should have known about it and your company was purposely keeping you in the dark. That's not okay. If you should have known about it and you, or you did know about it, then you must ensure that a disclosure is made. And as long as that disclosure is about your IPR and the definition of your IPR here is a patent or patent application that you or your sponsor owns or otherwise would benefit from. Maybe your sponsor has taken on a license on a patent. Uh, you can, that would be a patent that you would have to disclose if it is necessarily infringed. A necessarily infringed means if I make this, if I build a product that includes this technology described in the RFC, that I, the only way to do that is by infringing on your patent. If that's the case, then you have to tell us, you have to disclose that patent. This is not limited to RFCs, it's not limited to standards track RFCs. You have to disclose any time along the path as soon as you realize, because you don't know an internet draft what it's going to turn into. Maybe it's going to turn into a technical specification on the standards track. You don't know that, so you have to disclose as early as possible so the working group can take that disclosure into consideration. And this specifically includes patent applications. Even though many companies prohibit their employees from talking about patent applications, if they've got a patent application in, they must disclose the fact that they've got it if they're going to participate in the process. And so the first thing is you, 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 if this is your IPR, it's IPR that you personally know about or you should have known about. And if the, I, if the IPR is in a contribution you make, now, a contribution, we'll talk about that in a second, but let's say it's an internet draft, for example. If you publish an internet draft that has your patent covered material in there, you must tell us about it. If you stand up at a microphone and talk, talk about this is something that you should be able to do, or if this is a technology that the working group should adopt, and all you do is say it at the microphone, that's still, you still have to uh, tell us about it there. The, uh, the picture up there is a, of a patent disclosure and, a, and the hand is, a hand and a microphone are ways to represent what participation means. Participation means that you're doing anything to impact the discussion that's in, going on. So that, that if the IPR is in your contribution, what you say at the microphone or the internet draft you publish, then you must disclose. If the IPR is in a, in a um, contribution somebody else makes, but you, you'd look at it and say, oh, that's covered by my patent, and you are participating in any discussion on the contribution, then you must disclose. And participating here means doing anything that impacts the discussion. Saying something on a microphone, raising your hand during a show of hands, anything. Anything that um, is, would be possible to be seen as impacting the discussion if you're doing that, then you must disclose the IPR if you know about it. 
if the IPR is in a contribution that somebody else makes and you're not participating in the IETF process, so you're sitting on your hands, which is what the picture is, somebody's sitting on their hands, if you're not participating, we'd still like you to tell us about it. We don't have any rule that says you must. It'll be really unen unenforceable. But if you are doing, if you are sitting there in the room and watching it, or you subscribe to the mailing list and watching it, we would like you to tell us about it so the working group can take that into consideration when it's adopting technology. When should you disclose? Well, you must disclose as soon as you can after realizing that the disclosure is needed. Don't wait until last minute. Don't wait until the RFC is being pub uh, processed. Certainly don't wait until the RFC is being published. As soon as you know, uh, you, you, let, you do file a disclosure. The disclosures are, it's a web page for doing the disclosures. Most companies require that the company lawyers make disclosures, not, it's up, not up to the individual. Under ITF rules, the individual is responsible for ensuring a disclosure is made, but the individual doesn't have to make it themselves. What is a disclosure? It's basically a, a claim of intellectual property rights. Uh, how do I make one? Well, there's a link on the IETF homepage which says how to make a disclosure. Click here to do a disclosure. And it gives you a bunch of options of how to disclose. There are things that must be in the disclosure and things that might can be in the disclosure. What must be in the disclosure is the owner of the patent or patent application, the information about the patent or patent application, patent number, if, you, if you've got a patent, and information about the application, if it's an application, and the name and email address of the, whoever is doing the disclosure itself. In addition, we request the, the ITF participants name and email. So the person may, disclosing this may be a corporate lawyer. But we'd like to know who in the working group noticed this and, uh, and is, is a, asked for this disclosure. Which, the, which document triggered it? So is this triggered by an internet draft? Uh, and where in the document is the trigger? Is it section two? Is it section five? Is it the whole thing? What caused the disclosure to be happen? And we asked for licensing information. We'd like to say what type of license it is, FRAND, et cetera, uh, and the like, but we don't require it. We'd like to see it. Working groups are going to be much more comfortable in deciding to adopt a technology where they can see the license and they believe the license is fair. They're not allowed to go negotiate licenses with you. That's against antitrust laws. But they would like to see what's theirs in order to dis make a decision. What's a contribution? I've mentioned contributions a number of times here. A contribution is anything that you contribute in in words or in text, which uh, are designed to modify a technology specification or an, an internet, internet draft or RFC in any type. Uh, you know, if, you're going, if you're trying to inf influence that, either by text or by saying something on a microphone, then you've got to tell us about it. So you stand at the microphone and say, you know, if you change this feature here to do it this way, that would work better. And you have a patent on that or a patent application on that way, you gotta tell us about it. It's not limited to the purely the stuff that's in internet drafts. Anything you say at the microphone or anything you say on a mailing list is also covered. The note well note that I referred to easier talks to that. In some cases, plenary talks by the, the host of the meeting and things like that, they, they're not seen as contributions to the ITF. So if a vendor gets up there uh, who has been sponsoring in the IETF and says, uh, this is a wonderful new technology we've got, uh, and talks about that technology, they don't, have to disclose, they don't have to file an IPR disclosure to the IETF because they're not there to affect the standards process. The work, it's up to the working group. The working group can decide that it's not going to adopt any technology which has a IPR disclosure on it. No patents, the no patent policy W3C has, for example. But that's up to the working group. We have no flat rules. It is the case, though, that the ISG is unlikely to adopt a, to agree to adopt 
an internet draft as a standard track RFC if the technology is core to the internet. A few years ago we had a proposal to make a better TCP and that proposal came along with a patent disclosure and the general feeling was something as basic as TCP is not something that we will publish knowing that there's patent, patent implications of it. If it's something that's a st standard, a specific standard for a specific function, and it's not one of the core functions of the internet, such as routing or transport, then sure, we can adopt uh, technology that has patent disclosures on it. But if it's core technology, we don't. But then again, it's up to the working group. The working group is second-guessed by the ISG, but primarily it's up to the working group. And the working group can decide in itself whether to adopt a technology, even if it's got an IPR disclosure on it, or if a working group member knows that somebody else has done it already.